me. My name is Stephanie Herman. I'm the director here at the library. Just to tell you a little bit about the history of our Black History Month, we have done uh, stories of traditional civil rights uh, uh, stories and, and triumphs uh, through the years. But what we try to do with our Black History Month over the last couple of years is we really try to find these unique stories. And I always say, honestly, and it, it really is the truth, it's my favorite month. Uh, we do, every month we celebrate something different here at the library, but, but I love Black History Month because I learn something every year that I did not know. Stories of people that I did not know about. Uh, and I think many of these stories aren't in our history books. And that's why we kind of want to invest in this type of storytelling here at the library, is to bring these people's you know, lives to uh, our awareness, and especially for our kids. When our kids walk through our Black History Month exhibit, we want them to look at every one of our characters and say, you know, I want to be that one day. I want to be like that. And if they don't have those kind of role models in their life, you know, they want, they might not think that. And they might, it might not even cross their minds to, to do these things. So a couple of years ago, we did um, uh, African Americans in military service. We told a lot of really unique stories. Again, many that I did not know about. They were fascinating to me. We honored people here locally who had served. Uh, Landon Gray, he was one of our speakers uh, that year. Uh, he talked to us about one of his Broadway plays, um, uh, Black Angels of Tuskegee, of the Tus about the Tuskegee Airmen. And last year we did uh, Pioneers of Medicine. And we highlighted uh, characters throughout history uh, that were uh, had, had made significant advancements in medicine. And we highlighted some of our own local people that have gone on to do great things in medicine. And again, we just want kids to see these people from our parish or see people from our community and say, you know, I can do that. Um, so this year, I'll be honest, this one is very dear to my heart because the reason I'm in a sling is because I love the outdoors. And sometimes the outdoors doors doesn't love me back. But uh, anyway, it has always been like a really important thing to me. To really get kids involved with the outdoors. Uh, for Miss Cynthia Gadsden's um, after school program, they came here one day and we were going to we we're going to go on a, a camping trip. So I got a bunch of tents. We were going to go outside and put up tents. I was going to teach them how to build a fire and talk about camping skills. Uh, and it started raining. So we cleared the room out and I, we had all the tents here in the room. And I asked these kids. There were 24 kids there that day. I asked them, how many of you have ever been camping? Two children raised their hands. Those were the only two white children in the group. So the other 22 African American children in the group had never been had never been camping. Now that might not be the end of the world, really, but it does. It did. It hurt me a little bit because I have always had that love of the outdoors, and I really wanted to show kids that. Well, we ended up making a mess. And we built a fire and we made s'mores and we each one of those kids put up a tent and got in that tent and you would have thought we'd just gone to Disney World because they had a ball. So when this little theme came around and we began to think of people throughout history that we could show these students have been involved with the outdoors, like I said, this one is very dear to my heart. I um, saw a video not too long ago and it was they were interviewing uh, prisoners in a prison, and they were talking about uh, your, their outdoor time. They said, how many, uh, uh, apparently it's, uh, it's required that inmates have at least two hours of outdoor activity every day. And they were interviewing the, the prisoners about, how do you feel about your outdoor time? It's very important to us. You know, that's the time we, we're actually able to get outside and we're able to breathe a little bit. And then they said, what if we cut your hours? We took an hour away, and we, we only let you go outside one hour. How would you feel? And they're like, that would not be good. There would be restlessness. There would be probably fights. We need that outdoor time. So then they asked these students, I mean, they asked these prisoners, do you know who does only have one hour of outdoor time every day? And they're like, who? School children. School-age children, on average, only spend about an hour outside every day. So it's a really powerful little video about the importance of getting outside. Why it's good for us, why it's healthy for us to be outdoors and really enjoy that. 
Um, so I know I'm kind of probably talking more than everybody else is, especially about them. But it is dear to my heart, and I really appreciate what everybody on this panel is doing, and you and the pastors that are here, and the and the, the ministries that you have, the school teachers that are here, and the, the education you provide uh, to our students uh, about giving them all the opportunities in life that they can pursue. And this certainly is one of them. I think that is important. So at this time, I would like to introduce Reverend Dredd. He's going to get us started. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come into your gracious presence this evening, Lord, with many thanksgivings in our hearts. We thank you for the lives that we have, and we thank you for this gracious opportunity we have to assemble here tonight to celebrate Black History Month. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who trodden down paths and blazed trails before us. And Lord, we thank you also for those who are here today, whom you have purposed in their lives to live the lives that they live and we pray for them and we pray that everything we do here today will be to most of all to your glory as well as informational and enjoyment for us we ask these blessings in jesus name and for his name's sake we pray amen, amen. african american explorers and adventures black history month 2020 union parish library the goal of the 2020 black history month is to to reduce stereotypes and barriers for African Americans in the outdoors by celebrating the lives and stories of explorers and adventurers throughout black history. Join us as we step into the shoes of pioneers that climbed Mount Everest and explored wild and unforgiving landscapes. The courageous, the bold, the audacious. They were farmers, hikers, naturalists, biologists, environmentalists, rangers, cowboys, stagecoach drivers, fur traders, mountain men, farmers, aviators, soldiers, hunters, botanists, mountaineers, climbers, astronauts, guides, abolitionists, U.S. Marshals, spies, scouts, surveyors, zoologists, wilderness trigger, astronomers, conquistadors, cyclists, backpackers, writers, poets, campers, settlers, and founders. This list was not the past, but rather just the beginning. The list of Taurus, strong cyclist activist. <laughs> Taurus is a native of Monroe, Louisiana, holds a BS in psychology from Grammar State University. Correct you, sir. No, sir. Oh, no, sir. Southern. Southern University. It's hot to do it, yeah. He's maintained his love for cycling since, since childhood and has emerged as a successful entrepreneur. Strong operates a bicycle-based business, teach strong transportation. As a current bike text board, Texas board member, he has been involved in several bicycle infrastructures projects on the city level throughout Fort Worth and Dallas, megaplex. He is currently a lead of American bike, uh, bicycle, bicyclist board member and his goal is to expand or expose more individuals to cycling as a safe, useful, alternate form of transportation. Uh, that, 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 that's the one I would like to say, I think. Yes, Strong also travels the country, participates in various outdoor activities such as, uh, 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 what's that, what's that? Kayak? Yes, sir. Kayak. What is that? Canoeing. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Very interesting. Cycling and, and, and uh, we most of us are familiar with running. He recently launched an uh, adventure sport uh, podcast right up front. The goal is to highlight everyday people that are enjoying the outdoors by being active and living their life out front. 
he can be reached across social media platforms by using the following information at got strong uh, hashtag got strong come on let's welcome our speaker mr terrence strong cyclist active about yourself. Uh, I, I don't even know where to begin, but like you said, I am from Monroe, born and raised, uh, Carroll High School, and I'm looking at Mr. Keegan right here. Keegan, right? Is it? Mm -hmm. uh, we met earlier, so uh, he's the only one of a smaller statue, but the, the fire in his eyes is what I had when, when, I was, when I was smaller, and there were so many things I wanted to do coming from Monroe, but there was nobody that I knew that was doing it. And this is think about this is before the internet. This all I had was an encyclopedia to look at. And actually, cycling is not my first love. That's just how I was able to get around. Canoeing was my first love, but I had no access to the water because, especially in our community, you know, you're told you can't drink all that water. I don't want to drink it. I want to swim in it. I want to kayak in it. I want to canoe in it. And so. Uh, and we live where we live, my mother would only let me ride on the front and the back and the sidewalk. So cycling, by default, became my first love, but I've always had an interest in the walk. Uh, so you, you take that, I went to college, I rode my bike the entire time, and, and life happens, boom, I'm in Dallas. And you find out that people in Texas are amazed at what we have in Louisiana. And the guy said to me, uh, you from New Orleans? I said, no, sir. He said, are you familiar with Ruston? I'm like, yeah. He said, they have an amazing park. I'm like, really, they do? He said, yeah, he and his wife would drive from Dallas just to come to the Ruston State Park, ride all day and drive back. <coughs> I'm like, you sure, the one right down 20? <coughs> and he said, yeah, I said, oh. And more and more people in the cycling community in Dallas were just telling me about the great things we have here in Louisiana. So they would come to Ruston, or they would do Black Bayou. I'm like, yeah, I know what Black Bayou is. So I realized that, wait, I'm from an amazing place. And, I, but I hadn't tapped into it. I'm from here, and people in my circle had not tapped into it. So I made it my mission to, as much as possible, when I come home, to try to get other people involved in outdoor situations. And another benefit of being in Texas is, you realize things aren't as far as you think. So, okay, guys, say, hey, look. We're going to drive up to Little Rock. You want to go? I'm like, well, man, I don't have any gas money to help out. They say, well, hey, just help out driving. Well, I like to drive. And that, so you, you, you realize there are an entire group of people that don't look like you, don't eat the same type of food you were raised on, they really have a genuine interest in you as a person and getting you involved. Like Steph just said, it's something as simple as camping. So now I'm canoeing and cycling in Little Rock, you know. Um, like there was a Labor Day holiday that we did. Like, okay, now we're going to Oklahoma. Wait a minute. Now I'm actually going out and about in the woods with people that I don't know. But, you know, all the rumors we heard growing up, so we're going to West Texas. Wait a minute. Now I saved up a little money, business is going a little better. Hey man, we're we'll taking a trip out to Oregon. You wanna go? Sure. And once again, but no matter where I went, there were most times people that did not look like me. Which never bothered me. But everywhere I went, I was working with open arms, and I got a chance to grow, to learn more, and I've always tried to channel that back home, to bring that back. And not just to Monroe, but to the entire area. And I was just talking here with uh, Lane, and we went to rival high school, and you saw us laughing, talking, as if we've known each other for 30 years. And, and that's the beauty for me, of being involved in something non-traditional, because I meet other people, and, and you hit it off. You hit it off, and I know we're going to talk and laugh afterwards. So, uh, and we have hit, we finally have a few things in common. We do a few of the same people. But uh, the passion I have for cycling is the best for me. Even uh, we do the Eddie Robinson High School Classic. I ride my bike from Monroe to Grambling, 36 miles. For Bayou Classic Week, uh, five days, I ride from Grambling to New Orleans. So, any chance I get to be on my bike, I hop on it. Now, a pushback I've always had, I've always been a little heavier guy, a little husky. You know, at Sears and Penny, my mother would get the husky size. So things I wanted to do, visually, I didn't fit. I said, hey, I want to, you know, I want to canoe, I want to kayak, I want to run. They said, look at you, people playing football. You can't tell me what I want to do. This is my desire and my passion. 
And it took a little longer to get there because, like I said, people in my circle weren't doing these non-traditional things. But um, I've stuck with it through the years, and I'm now you know, have some, some elected positions in Cypher. I go to D.C. several times a year. We lobby, talk to congressmen and senators and all that stuff. And another bit of fear, I say, hey, I live in Dallas. Hey, well, I'm from, you know, the senators from Ar South Arkansas. I'm not one familiar with it, but he doesn't know Monroe and Farmerville are right here on the border. Well, I talked to a, an elected official from Louisiana. So cycling for me has opened so many doors, so many doors that take me so many places I never thought I would go. Once again, we're talking about the bike ride in New York City. They only shut down the streets of New York City for two events, the New York Marathon and the Bike New York Bicycle Ride. And a close friend of mine hosts the New York Bicycle Ride. And so, um, can I just, just give you an idea of how cycling has grown and then to bring it back to the potential that's in this area for cycling. I know you're talking about cycling safety. So I'm also an instructor and what we try to do is go to various communities and point out things that can be adjusted, things that need to be done and we work with locals and all the way up to the state level and federal level by getting revenue brought into a community. There's plenty of money available. It's just a matter of packaging it the right way and presenting it to your elected officials. For example, hey, you know what? My child has to go from home to the high school, you know, go to the, to the local school. We, I need my child to feel safe going. And we put that plan in action. So there's always things to do, um, and don't let anyone tell you what can't be done, especially when it comes, I mean, for me, if, if everything on my shirt is what I love doing. Cycling, running, kayaking, canoeing. If I could, I would ride my bike back to Monroe now, but there's no show. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I just really love, I just love being outdoors, even with camping. But my first job out of college was uh, at an outdoor wilderness retreat. And once again, I had people telling me, you don't want to do that. You didn't go to college for that. You should be in an office. Okay, but Jacques Cousteau was outside. You know, he has his, his degree, his credentials. And so I was always drawn to the outdoors. I worked in an office setting, I taught school, but that's not where my passion was. That was just a check. I really love being outside. I love the outdoors, tent camping, primitive camping, but whatever you throw at me, I might find you know, summer rise in the morning. But uh, just overall, I, I, I truly just love, I love home. All of these parishes combined are home for me, and I love being outdoors. So uh, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? About bikes, how to ride a hundred miles on a bike? <laughs> 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 yes, sir. 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 Yes, so you can start with a car, shot, a bike, or a bicycle for Walmart. Because it's your legs that are the engine. And then you can make that adjustment. You know what? This seat doesn't go high enough. These handlebars extend out too far. Mm -hmm. And if you're dedicated to it, after about two months, you're going to save up and get you something a little bit more. So I have a bow, and I say a bow. I have seven assembled bikes, two not assembled, and one I'm trying to sell. So I don't have a sincere number. But to have a commuter bike, a mountain bike, a road bike, a uh, bike when it's raining, but you don't have to do all that. But yeah, so like when I do the ride from Monroe to Grambling, that's not the same bike I take from Grambling to New Orleans. Longer distances that I prep for the weather. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I also do 100 mile bicycle rides, uh, endurance rides. And for me, five hours is great. But my friends do it in four hours. Some people do it in 10. But it's not you against the clock, it's just you against yourself. And as we know, especially in the African American community, health disparities are through the roof. From heart situations, I don't know what the man would go down this gal, you know, everything that, that affects us health wise. So that's just me trying to invest in myself and trying to stave off what I can, you know, as far as for the diet, proper exercise, because. In our community, parking two slots back in Walmart not going to pay. That's not enough for us, you know. We, we are a special people, so we have to go extra special with our exercise. And, and honestly, even when it comes to food, everything we were raised on, most of it not good for us. Especially high quality. And I love turkey eggs. I promise I do. But, you know, it's, you know, but we, can't, we can't eat that every day and be stagnant. 
and not to preach. But uh, is there any more questions? Yes, sir. Woo, buddy. How fast is the bike go? <laughs> For me, <laughs> top speed, I don't know what they call it, 18. That's a great question, too. I'm an 18 to 20 mile an hour person. So over five hours, it puts me at about 100 miles with two stops. Um, the, the pros you see, the Tour de France, those guys average about 28 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, and, you know, so they're 10 miles further out per hour. So they can do 100 miles in three and a half hours. Like nothing. Um, and a beginner, probably about 12 miles an hour. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, well, what's a good speed if you start off, oh, man? Let me see. Somebody <coughs> like you, what, you about four grand? Oh, oh, okay. Well, this is February. Yeah, school almost out. Yeah, you're almost four grand. Four grand project. All right, so uh, for you, if you got on the bike and rode about 30 minutes a day, I think that'll be good for you. Start off going to the store, riding around the neighborhood, and any bike will do. It doesn't have to be an expensive bike. That's the question, what's that? That's all right. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Tim. Oh, okay. One more. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the website is uh, bikeleague.org. I'm not glad to talk to you guys, but bikeleague.org. And, and what we do is this is a national organization, and we sit down and figure out what, it, what are the needs of a particular community. And we also issue out awards, so we have the bicycle-friendly state, bicycle-friendly colleges, bicycle-friendly schools and communities. So bikeleague.org. And he has brochures and cards at his display on the other side of the library. I think, yeah, there's a nice setup outside. And I'll tell you, with information on that, but I'll be glad to ask any questions you have. And uh, to your point, a, a community like this, you say, you know what, right now, we just want street lights. We just want speed bumps. I mean, just the small stuff. And, and we can help you get set up with that and who can get in contact with on the state level. And those things are possible. Yes, sir. Right. Another question? Okay. You said what color was what now? Uh, I'm out of here. What color was it? Oh, well, uh, my bike? <laughs> <laughs> my first bike was red with yellow flames, so uh, let's go with that one. <laughs> yeah, that was my first bike. All right. Well, hey, thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed being here.
leaves Alabama. She's become an outdoor woman, which is BOW, B-O-W. She's also done some engagements with L-D-W-F, fishing camps at uh, Fort Worth, not Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Louisiana, and has been honored to be published in the Texas Outback Magazine. She's also had the opportunity to be featured on several podcasts. And just recently, she participated in a, pod, a podcast interview with the woman angler at the Federation of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now, as for the back riders, this professional angler started riding in December 2017 after she graduated from the Louisiana State Troopers course. After she passed her test, she said she's been riding ever since. This young lady truly believes that God, her husband, her family, and her friends are her biggest support. Now, let me introduce you to the Fishing Diva. And the Bacchus Bravo is not other than the professional angler, Mrs. Tarika Whitty. And I just, everything that I do in my life is always, like it's always fast in my faith and anything I do is about my faith. My faith, is, my faith and my family are all important to me. Um, I don't even, I don't know if I can even come close to what times have done, um, but I'm going to give it a shot. I have um, been all over the world defending this country and been in places I have not liked. I met my gorgeous husband while I was in the military and um, doing drill sergeant duty and all of that. I've done a lot of engagements and, and let me tell you, every place I've been, there's not been one person in the room that looks like me. And this is the first time that I've been in a room of people that look like me. And I thank God because I did not think that I would ever be in a place like this. I am normally, um, I do, when I do engagement, I'm, I'm never with adults, I'm always with kids, so I'm kind of nervous. Because um, kids are easy, you already know what they're going to ask. Um, so I just, um, for my career, it started out, I got to um, set up an international fishing organization while I was overseas stationed in Korea. Um, it was called SIFO, Soldiers International Fishing Organization. We took soldiers all around South Korea. I was on a Korean tele, um, TV, uh, did a Korean interview while I was in South Korea. Um, I don't know any of the words, but they translated my English to their words. Um, I was in a Korean magazine. I got to fish with a lot of guys over there. I am probably the only person that looks like me that's ever been given an opportunity to be on a boat style and to stand out in front of people. Because in my world, there is not anyone that fishes. And the problem that we have in our community is that our children are so terrified of the water that they don't get to go out and see the outdoors. We don't take the opportunities. I understand that we grew up in a time where you know, we walked the, the ponds and creeks and our, our family, our, our elders told us, hey, don't you get in that water, you're going to drown. Or, I can't drink all that water, you can't drink all that water. Listen, nowadays, you can go, like I tell the kids at Fort Polk, there is always swimming. You can go to the inside, you can go to the gym, or you can go to the pool on Fort Polk. And those kids get to swim in there for free. But when I go to the pool, you know who's in there in the pool? not any of our kids. Because they're telling, because our kids are taught that, hey, basketball, baseball, football is what's going to make it. No matter. Fishing is a billion dollar sport that is completely untapped. And there are places and that you will never see that you'll only hear about. I am one, my husband and I are one of two people that goes to a show that's called ICAST. Our cast is done every year in Florida, and for the last four years it's been in Florida. 
our test consists of all the tackle that you will see for the following year. So for example, this coming July, we'll be at ICAST. We'll be doing live video feed, and we'll be seeing all the tackle and all the boating equipment, anything dealing with fishing, we'll see it in July of this year, and it'll come out to the consumer next year. Women in fishing right now are, whether they're a minority or not, they serve at 17%. When we went to the show last year, they did, they did a, 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 a symposium, with, and it's called 50 by 50, and it's uh, Take America Fishing. You know how come you don't know anything about that? Because nobody's, nobody's talking to you all. Fishing is like the biggest, fishing is the big secret unless you're talking to somebody. And me, I, because I love the outdoors and I love the fishing, I love meeting new people and I love doing this, I'm always asking questions. You know, when the gang ones, when the gang ones come up, when I come to Texas, you know what they say? They don't even ask me for license. You know why? Because they know I got it. Because there are guys out there that will do things that are not um, respectable. Yeah, they're not legal. But because I'm the only person that looks like me, I've been checked one time. On to look again. I've been checked one time. If something goes wrong on Toledo Bend and I'm out here on the water, you can best believe somebody comes to look because I'm the only black girl in the entire state that's out there. And so my thing is I'm always trying to get more kids and more women. I understand you men are going to fish. Y'all going to be out there. But you know what? My goal is to get more kids and more women out of, in, into the outdoors. And listen, don't worry about your hair. Don't worry about the water, don't worry about the sun, don't worry about your makeup. We already do that. It's all about getting our kids and getting more people out there because this sport is growing. And if we don't do something to save our children, nobody else is. And I'm telling you, if the more kids, if we could get more kids into cycling and, and, and doing the outdoors, this world, our community, would be a better place and we wouldn't have to go visit our kids behind bars. Um, that's all I have. I don't want to get on my phone. Are there any questions? Yes. When it comes to fishing, I'm, I'm just as true. Let's say, let's say it's like 10 pound test line. Mm -hmm. Does that mean like it's, well, I thought it meant it was only waiting to catch a 10 pound fish. Mm -hmm. But then you'll see where a guy caught a 30 pound fish on a 10 pound test. I never understood what that meant. It's the breaking point. Okay. So like right now, you can have a 10 pound test and probably land that fish. It's all about how you fight the fish. Okay. Just remember, you're not fighting the person. You're fighting the fish on the other end. When you step out on that water in your kayak, it's not about you fishing against other kayak people. It's about you and that animal. Okay. Okay. Do you still enjoy game boat fishing? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I have days four days and we get on the Savannah River, I have three boats. So I have my river boat, my little northern boat that my dad and I own, and then I have a trident with my backup boat, and then I have my sponsor boat. And I don't fish with nothing that looks like a cane pole. <laughs> I, I'm not, we use cane poles, we bundle them together and make brush piles for white poles. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's the most exotic fish you ever caught? I don't do anything but bass fish. Just bass? That's it. That's it. That's it. I, I, the mic, I'm a angler. Not, I'm not into all that exotic stuff. Exotic don't make me no money. What about fly fishing? Don't do fly fishing either. Fly fishing is growing, but bass fishing is a big big sport. That's what everybody wants to do. That's why we all run around with this $100,000 $100, rig in trucks. <laughs> Yes, sir. And uh, if somebody was interested in going professional in fishing, how would you start? By doing uh, my, uh, I would say you today everything is social media driven, so you have to be active on social media. Um, you know, and, and sponsors will come to you. Um, uh, for example, Spike It um, is a dive company. You see it in any bank, local bank tavern store. I've been with those guys for 10 years. They picked me up. They approached me. And then you got to have a leg up. My niche was I'm the only person that looks like me that wears a tennis skirt. 
So my friends call me the Serena Williams of Basket. <laughs> so when I step into a place, I am just that. I am a girl. My husband, female. My husband told me, he said, listen, babe, you don't look like anybody else. So you got to play to your strengths. And the fact that I am African-American, I'm a veteran, and then my husband bought me my first tennis skirt, so that opened the door for me. So when I got through that door, guess what? I knew how to talk. And I studied and studied and studied. Nobody taught me. My parent, my my parents, my grandparents, nobody taught me anything. Everything that I learned has been trial and error. I didn't even know how to drive a boat when I first started fishing. But because God has been went before me, he always put somebody ahead of me and said, hey, let me teach you this. And, and he's right. Don't nobody look like us. I have been in, you know, Jasper has this bad reputation of being the worst place you can go. No, sir. Everything in Jasper has been good to do. I have been in some places where I have no cell service. It's an over the wall. And I've been the only person in the room. But you know what? Everybody in there welcomed me. And nothing, because I have always counted on my faith and believed in God, God has endorsed me. Amen. No, ma'am, I have not. Um, we were looking at Lake Darbon. I'm with an organization now called the Women's Basketball. I'm the site director. So I'm the person that's responsible for setting up the tournaments, the hotels, talking to the Chamber of Commerce, and having the ladies come and fish areas. So we were just looking at the water up here. Because like I said, this is my first time coming to Farm So you have more questions? That's my time. Thank you all. Good evening, everyone. I have a privilege to uh, introduce a person with such an <clears throat> extensive and impressive resume as Mr. Murray Beckford. The United States Fish and Wild Service, Wildlife Services has appointed Mr. Beckford as the new leader for the <clears throat> National Wildlife Refuges in North Louisiana. Beckford started in September and says he wants to follow the footsteps and man of managers before him to promote <coughs> the National Wildlife Refuge System and keep the community and residents of North Louisiana well informed of the benefits of wildlife conservation. He wants to expand and develop new ideas to work alongside other <coughs> partners for conservation of wildlife related creating uh, recreational opportunities like hunting, fishing, and bird watching. He says, in my youth, I worked on a family farm, hunted and fished in the hills of Lincoln Parish. I thought it would be a good, <clears throat> be a great opportunity to get a job doing something that I love to do, said Bester. Working with the United States Fish and Wildlife Services on the National Wildlife Refuge, has proven to be the best thing I could do to combine my passion for wildlife and conservation with my education and training. He will be in charge of the Darbonne Upper, <coughs> Darbonne Upper, Washita, Handy Lake, Black Bayou Lake, Red River National uh, Wildlife Refuge. For the last three years, Mary has served in the Regional Office of Atlanta first as assistant deputy chief of the wildlife refuge uh, system, then as deputy refuge supervisor and acting refuge supervisor for Florida and the Caribbean. Mr. Buford is, <coughs> Mr. Buford's wide array of experiences across Southeast, Southeast field stations and then leadership roles at the regional level in Atlanta make him a very well qualified to do the job, said David Biker, the regional chief of the National Wildlife Refuge System. <coughs> Mr. Buford began his 17-year 17, 17 career with the Fish and Wildlife Services. Mr. Buford, Mr. Bedford worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, excuse me, 
Wildlife Services for nine years as a lead biologist for state programs in New York and later in Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois. He was responsible for field operations, environmental assistance, and management plans. He was born in Lincoln Parish and grew up in Grambling, Louisiana. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Grambling State University, attended uh, Louisiana Tech, Tennessee Tech University. Mr. Bedford and his wife, Melissa, who located in Norman, Louisiana in September, enjoy bike riding. I can canoe hunting and fishing. They have two grandsons, grown sons, Sean 26 and Mark 21, and two grandsons, and look forward to the to passing along hunting and fishing traditions to the next generation. A hundred years in the making, the National Wildlife Refuge System is, is a network of, inha <clears throat> of habitat and beneficial life benefits wildlife, provides unparalleled outdoor experiences for all Americans, and protects a healthy environment. Today, there are more than 560 National Wildlife Refuge and 38 wetland management districts, including one within the within hours drive of most major metropolitan areas. The refuge provides habitat for more than 700 species of birds, 220 species of mammals, 250 of, of reptiles and amphibians like, uh, species, and more than 1,000 species of fish, more than 380 threatened and endangered plants or animals are protected in wildlife refuge. Each year, millions of migrating birds use the refuge as stepping stones while they fly thousands of miles between their summer and winter homes. I present to you so, um, hold on. Say good evening to everyone. I didn't write all the stuff. I have uh, by uh, uh, the last job I had before I moved here, uh, which was about five years ago. So, uh, so uh, they had to get their clothes in about fish and wildlife search, about all the animals and all that other stuff. But what it all boils down to is that it's pretty simple, straightforward, right hand, or do this. That's the way it all sums up. I want to thank Ms. Herman for inviting us, for inviting me, and the other panelists. I'm glad to see you all up here. Thanks for questions so many ways that we could probably incorporate everything that you all are doing from the, from the refugees here in North Louisiana. So, um, so I don't even know where to start other than I've already started a bit by saying that I've been blessed and that is the, that is the honest and you know, the truth uh, about it. Um, you know, I grew up in Atlanta, um, hunted fish when I was a kid. And uh, I think I was a junior in high school when I started thinking about college and so forth. Since, you know, it was the greatest university in Louisiana. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so, uh, so uh, I, I started thinking about a career. And I thought about it. And I, I actually wanted to be a, a, a pediatrician. You know, but I was thinking about it. I said, well, you know, uh, a kid gets sick or whatever, and the parents can't figure out what's going on. What are they going to do? They're going to do me. And I want y'all to do it. You know, I was thinking about, you know, just uh, a way of living you know, and so forth. But then it, it came to me the best thing for me to do was get paid for something that I love to do. So that was hunting and fishing. So that's why I, that's why I ended up getting, uh, getting into this field. Um, like, um, like, um, like you were saying, the idea of a um, book encyclopedia. Uh, I don't even know if kids nowadays know what encyclopedias are. 
But we had a couple sets. We had like a red Britannia, and then we had a green and white whirlwind. And um, I, I used to shoot birds when I was a kid. You know, like I said, bird in the hand, bird going in the bush. But what I would do uh, is that um, I started bird watching, and um, I started using that encyclopedia trying to identify birds and stuff. So I got to know my birds, and then I started looking on the trees and and all that other stuff. But the values that I had um, when I was growing up um, were still by my parents and my, and my grandparents. Um, we had a small farm and a base house and not fun to like at all, like you wouldn't do anything. And right after school, all the way to dark, all the time. So, so um, I, uh, my first job was um, uh, working for USDA as a wildlife biologist with them. And um, my first job, federal job, was in the state of New York. Uh, around the young man had never been to any place that much. So uh, I thought about it and I said, well, uh, New York is one place I probably would never go. So I took the job and I went there. I was making about $14,000 a year living in the state of New York. And who knows? But that was the most money I had ever made. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I went and did that, and since my career started right back in those days, I moved around about nine times in my career, and uh, had a chance to see a lot of uh, amazing things, work with some endangered animals, and uh, um, been really blessed by just some of the experiences. Um, one of the interesting things about um, this career and a lot of work that we do is that you're right. You don't see enough of us. Um, even here, every place I've gone, I've been trying to promote getting outdoors, canoeing, and some other things too. And the first thing I hear is, is are there snakes out there? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not going. <laughs> you know, are there alligators out there when you go canoeing? Yes, they're out there, but they don't, they're not thinking about you. Well, I'm not going. You know, and it's a fear. And that's a, and, and to be honest with you, um, um, there are people in this society that want us to be afraid. Yes. Because they can do things to themselves. So, you know, if you really think about how God, how good God is on this creation, um, you ever pay the time to look at the sunset or, or just see the colors of a duck, you know, just, you know, it, it's amazing, you know, of how, you know, God has done so much. So, so, um, so as of December, I uh, probably got my 30 years in. So I got my 30 years in and I'm going to retire. And I'm not quite ready yet because there's so much work to do. Uh, our youth, uh, right now, so tied up and, um, Playstations, Xboxes. I don't even see kids playing out in, in the yards anymore like we used to. But that's something that we have to work on and so forth. So, um, so with me being here um, close to the home, um, uh, I'm working real hard trying to get more of us out into the community. Uh, and it's, it's a real big challenge. So, Many of you on the panel here can uh, get a uh, phone call or something. Uh, we got a hundred miles of road that we can probably use some bikes on. We got several bikes that we can actually uh, 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 do some fishing on. Maybe hold the clay or something like that. Uh, yeah. okay. So, um, I have a whole lot to say, uh, but I'm not going to uh, drag on for much more. But, um, I just I do want to be a thank you all for an hour down here to be here. And uh, it's been a, a great career and I would recommend it for being in my life about you. So I'm gonna turn it over to I'm glad you asked that. Um, so so uh, we talked about getting people outside and, and so forth, but 
uh, one of the biggest challenges, I guess, is uh, getting people to see beyond the color. Uh, what, I've, um, what I've learned is that because of the color of my skin and stuff, people automatically feel that you can't do anything. They, they always, you know, throughout my career, it's been one of those things where they would say, uh, we didn't know what, what to do with you. Uh, we didn't know, you know, we came and they said we wanted to, uh, you know, to work and stuff, and we just didn't know. So the, the biggest challenge, I guess, uh, was to try to turn people's opinions around. And everything else. My mother always told me that whatever I did, I had to work three times as hard because uh, we're going to be looked at a little bit different. So the challenge for me is, was to. Um, uh, initiate myself and work hard when people say that they that you need to show up at five o'clock, I'll be there for a break. Mm -hmm. and, um, just to prove the point. And whenever someone says that well, Mario, you really don't have to do that, and I say, okay, but thanks for telling me that, I do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, and it was just those kind of challenges and not I mean that's the force we tell folks along the way. Uh, you know, but that was probably one of the biggest challenges. It was just a deep pushing hard without anything else. So when we talk about this career of being in wildlife and stuff, we have myself and, and two other folks who fish in wildlife. Folks. So to give you an idea about where we are uh, as far as the race associated with being out of doors. Of um, all natural resource uh, related jobs, 97% of them are women. Of that 3%, they're minorities. But of that 3%, only 1% of them are women. So that gives you an idea. So um, I went to Groundwood, graduated with Mr. Benson um, from Groundwood. Uh, there's a group of us about. What is that? Original group? Of uh, six in the original group, and there's probably 16 or more um, in, in addition to that. The graduated from Grammar, one of the greatest universities in the country. All these folks that are in the all the graduates, um, all of us are working with Fish and Wildlife Service, or with the Park Service, or with uh, the Water Service. And um, when we talk about the idea of being the only person, and it's gotten to the point where I'm just used to it. I mean, it's just, you know, if I go in there and see somebody else, I'm running across the street. You know, but like, what's your name? What's your name? You know, where are you from? You know, because you just don't see it. But um, uh, that's been one of the biggest challenges that there. Um, it's something that we have to do. I have a question. Uh, two of the refuges that you manage are here in our parish, uh, Darbonne and Washita. What do you see are the challenges for those two refuge systems, and how can we as a community do something positive to support your work? Uh, well, let's see. Um, probably the biggest challenge that we have right now is uh, the lack of personnel. Mm -hmm. We uh, uh, can't say something, but um, based on, on the last uh, six or seven years, we lost probably not just just those refugees, not the ones that have been in the um, just in the southeast, we lost over 160 positions. And we're having so many people retire. The way that um, things are working is that there is no new crop of people coming up through the system. So people are retiring, and they're just not in those positions now. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, we have great support from the community. One of our refugees here in North Louisiana. The biggest challenge is, is uh, uh, pretty much keeping the world open. Uh, and um, getting some uh, support, whether you want to go to the local industries and so forth. Uh, we love to work with the city um, more as well as well. Someone just starting out, what would be the base pay for the base if we just start out? So now, uh, with the pay scale right now, it will probably be 
uh, a GS4. That's what I started off as. Uh, GS4, I think, is probably about 19,000. I started it. I started it. I started off with it. But the way that it works is that once you're on board, so that every year uh, you're available to make motion possible for it, depending on what you have so I'm going to keep it here. Well, absolutely. And uh, the size of the limit, if you, if you want, I had to move nine times to make it do it. And we walk into some stuff that most of those would cringe at. You know, I never will forget um, walking through a swamp area and we were tracking the beef, right? And uh, the guy was in front of me. So one rule is, is that if they don't go in, I'm not going in. So <laughs> I'm not going to go out. If they said, oh, you need to go over there, I said, right after you. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, I was, I was in my waiters. And uh, um, I'm just saying, well, he's going to knock some bike in the face or whatever. But uh, the water was up this high. It was just massive grass. And it was a real uh, wet place and stuff. So on my way there and everything else, uh, I was brand new like keys on the case. I could get in But um, on my way back, um, we, uh, we encountered some snakes right in that area. So, so that was one of the. Uh, I mean, I played it off as best I could, you know. And one of the things I figured out is that, you know, you're trekking in, in uh, high grass or wet areas or whatever, don't look around it because if you look, you're going to see something. <laughs> so if you see a tree that you headed to, get to that tree. And it didn't turn around. You know. But now that you know, you have to go back to the grass. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Good evening. I am here to introduce Ms. Nova Clark, the environmental educator. Nova Clark is the environmental educator for Black Bayou National Refuge and works explaining the wow to refuge guests and other programs on a daily basis. But believe it or not, Nova was a city girl. She grew up as a city girl in Miami, but this is actually where she developed her affection for reptiles. She always loved exploring outside of her normal world and learning about reptiles and creepy crawlers, even through books, was something that gave her that sense of adventure outside of her normal world. In college, as a geology major and as an active participant in the University Outdoors Club, she truly started to really enjoy being out in nature and hiking and camping. After college, she interned at White Sands National Monument, now National Park, in New Mexico, and that started her career as an interpretation ranger. Over the last 22 years, she has worked at eight different National Park Service sites, primarily out in the Southwest and in Alabama, as well as for California State Parks. And the last seven years, she has been the rescue ranger at Black Bayou Lake in WR. She also spent a year teaching at a residential outdoor education center in Minnesota. Nova has an approach to teaching student groups that helps them develop a, na a natural sense of curiosity, but also respect for wildlife and our environment. She enjoys sharing her love of nature with people and getting them to explore, whether it is by touching a snake, mm, or taking a walk in the woods and thinks it is important to start as young as possible. Perhaps that's because Nova is still really that little girl from Miami who has a sense of wonder and exploration inside herself. Either way, Nova is an example that no matter where you are from in life, the wild, wild world is wide open and empty. It's Nova. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you for having me here tonight. 
Um, so yes, I was a city kid growing up. My parents still never looked my creed out high in the WMG. Very confused. Um, and that, they were pretty convinced I was going to be a lawyer. Because I was going to be a lawyer when I grew up. Until like college, and I was like, I'm only going to spend three more years in school. Because, you know, the doors. Um, they made me take the LSAT after I graduated from college. And I'm like, you are going to take the LSAT. You know, bad you up on that. Um, but I was lucky enough to be able to go on a couple of programs in elementary school with the National Park Service out and be outside. And one of my first memories from that is going to Swoosh Log in the Everglades with alligators right there. I was like, that's all. Which is why I have no fear of alligators now, because I'm like, oh, that's all they didn't eat me. I'm not going to eat you now. Um, and at, so one of the things is people mention that you don't see people like us outside. For me, it's kind of an interesting thing. My dad is Jamaican, he's black, my mother's white. Um, and what I found is usually somebody else who is black can recognize that I'm part black. Somebody who's not black, I'm everything else in the Adobe universe. <laughs> 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 Whatever. Um, and it's kind of funny that I found it interesting. The Navajo is pretty funny because I was like, Navajo is going to have to Not at all. Um, but that was what I worked in the So the expectation is, if you see somebody in that area, they're what you think is supposed to be there, one way or the other. Um, so I went to college at Washington Lee University in Virginia, which is named after who the two people you think it's named after. It's an old school, but I was lucky enough, I was on a scholarship, because the reality is there's not a whole lot of minority students who went to that school. So I was going to see the high school. Uh, my parents were like, you will get a scholarship one way or the other, um, if you want to go to college. And when I got there, I was still going to be a politics major, because I was going to be a lawyer, but the requirement was you take a science class. I was not going to take biology, because I was not going to dissect anything. Chemistry, no. Physics, absolutely not. So I was like, oh, geology. And what geology does is it gets you outside, because the rocks are outside. You have to go hiking. You have to go walk around in the woods. Um, and because I went to a very small school, it was 1,600 undergrad, your professors knew who you were. They called you out, and I was lucky enough. My second, my uh, sophomore year, is I went and I went on a trip out west with our geology department. Three band loads of college students, one six-year-old professor. We went out west. It was my first time out west, and I fell in love with it. And then I was been camping and everything in college with the yachting club and stuff like that. Uh, but it made, really made me realize I want to be outside. And one of the things that's sort of been an ongoing fun stuff with the geology department. Um, and work with some other people is, for whatever reason, African Americans don't seem to want to become geologists. I don't know why. But it's also like a lot of the HBCUs do not have any geology department, no geology programs. But if you think about it, especially in Louisiana, petroleum geology, looking for oil, that's where money is. And you have to study geology if you want to go make that money. And so it's a shame that that's not emphasized at all. There's a couple of people I know who are working to try to get African Americans into geology. You can make some money doing that. But it doesn't help me outside. Um, and so when I graduated from college, I didn't know what to do, and I did apply for internships. At that point, I was flipping through a giant book. Um, I ended up in White Sands, New Mexico, um, which is southern New Mexico. It's the world's largest drifts in new fields. It's beautiful, it's amazing. Um, not really any African Americans in that city. There's some, there's a couple of military bases, and there were some people there. Um, and, but what I found out is I really like sharing nature with people. And so I kind of pursued my career, and I started out as a seasonal, and I finally got on permanent in Alabama at Russell Cave. And then I went back out to west of Canyonlands, uh, which is a national park. It's in southern Utah, it's on Moab. Lots of mountain biking in Moab. That's what it's known for. Um, and it was pretty funny because there was me and there was one other gentleman in the whole group of about four parks who was also African American. And we used to joke that our superintendent would go to meetings and be like, I'm too. You all don't have any. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you actually did that or not. But we used to joke about that because the reality is the parks are southwest. There's very few minority rangers, like hardly any. Um, and part of it is, I think a large part of it is kids aren't exposed to being outside. And so the idea of moving to Utah. Honestly, it's, if that's what you're used to, that's freaky. Utah is one of the two whitest states in the United States. <laughs> um, 
But what I also found is that history of African Americans, you can tell it was kind of a race. Outside of Moab was a canyon that was originally known as, a word I will not use, Bill Canyon. Um, because historically, there was a term that was used for African American cowboys that we do not use now, obviously. But there was a movement at that point to totally, it was not called that anymore, it was called Negro Bill Canyon. And there was a movement among some people to remove that name and just call it William Ransom Candy, which was the name of the guy who actually the cowboy. And there were about four of us in the entire part of Southern Utah who objected to that. And the reason was if you name it William Ransom Candy, nobody's going to know he was a black man. I mean, you have to like, literally root it. If it's Negro Bill Candy, people are like, oh, he's a black man. He was after back in the 1800s, he was farming, he was a cowboy. We also had on, on site, we had an archaeological site that was unfortunately a wanted poster for another white bill person. <laughs> and I remember people were like, you should change it, you should wipe it down. Like, first off, it's an archaeological site. It also shows there was also a black man out here, out west in the 1800s. Um, and what you have to do is educate people about why that term was used back then. Obviously, we don't use it now, but in the 1800s, that was unfortunately common usage at that point. You can't just wipe history clean by remaining in it. Um, so I worked out west for a lot of years, where there were very few minority rangers. I remember one time a came when a minority, a black couple walked in, and we looked at each other, and we were both like, ah, because they didn't expect to see me, and I totally didn't expect to see them. We had this other chat, they were from California, they were great. Uh, and they were traveling to national parks. Very few people do that. You are, you're not white, in all honesty, or foreign. There's way more Europeans who come over to our national parks than African Americans. Um, so you can meet, meet, meet people who speak every language known to man, but you're not too likely to see an African American family out in Canada to the Grand Canyon. Um, and that's all our heritage. National parks are meant to work for all of us. Um, so I've been, I've been around a lot of times out west. Um, my job before this was at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Um, and I mean, Booker to Washington and George Washington Carver were, but when I worked there, I didn't really know who they were. And the thing that's raised from the history books is both those men were outdoorsy. Dr. Washington was usually dressed in a suit when he was outdoorsy, but still, he liked to garden. He was outside. Dr. Carver went wandering in the woods for days. He got wandered off. He didn't care. He was a mycologist. He studied mushrooms. He's made more mushrooms than a lot of other people. At that point, nobody knows that. All I think about Dr. Carver's peanuts, which he did make 200 plus things out of peanuts and sweet potatoes. But he also was a fantastic artist. He could sew, he could paint, he made paint for people, um, for former slaves to make sure they could have beauty in their life and paint their house. So it wasn't just this old thing. And Dr. Carver was very much open to everybody. And so we did a lot of environmental education, we talked about gardening, all of that stuff. And I worked with a lot of college students at Tuskegee, they interned for me, and also high school students. And I remember once spring, I was like, let's go canoeing. And they all told me, they're like, there's no boat, black people do not camp. I was like, really? And everybody insisted on that. They're like, no, there's no boat, we do not do this. I was like, we're going to uh, canoeing. They're like, oh, I think they're all convinced I was going to kill them or something. <laughs> Yeah, it was like during daylight. Um, I wasn't thinking about what's at night. They had the best time where they actually got gave a chance. They were like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. And for me, the other thing that I always put out to them was like, so historically, you do realize that African Americans spend a lot of time outside. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when Dr. Washington was a child, if they wanted to eat, they went to the woods and they harvested plants. They had to find other stuff. Um, and for whatever reason, and I had a lot of older volunteers, in fact, one of my volunteers turned 100, like, five years ago. She was one of the first black photographers, female black photographers in the entire country. Um, and all these older women and men, they guarded, they were outside, all that stuff, but the younger kids were like, oh, no, we're not doing that. And to me, that, there's that part missing, like, somehow it went away. We don't have to do things like that. Um, Dr. Dixon, that was her name. First black female daughter of the United States. Um, and then I came here, and I was very lucky in the sense that when I was hired, it was part of more being in here. My boss pretty much let me run with what I wanted to do. And for me, as a kid, remembering that I didn't look at the outdoor thing, my focus had been handled outside. 
Um, because like, as, like she said, when she introduced me, if you don't get that exposure when you're a kid, you're not going to get into it. And then there will be a pipeline for future rangers because as kids, I'm going to be a ranger. Because why would I be a ranger? I'm outside. Oh my gosh, it's scary. Um, and yes, I do cover on the snake quite a bit. <coughs> Um, the snake is indeed in the Parish Library in Portland, one of the many schools. It's a very friendly thing. Um, I have two of them that are super friendly. They love everybody. Stephanie asked me about it in the first night, so I was like, I don't want to chase up the audience. I know my audience. But the amazing thing to me when I work with the kids is it's usually the adults who freak out more on the audience, but you can usually get the kids to touch. And they're like, oh, it's not nearly as scary as we thought. Um, <laughs> I, I told I told me nobody has to touch because they said the same part of the ecosystem. Um, same thing with elevators. I'll be off to the board. I don't know everywhere I'm going because you don't know if there's a snake if you're not there. Because I, I take walks with kids out of the woods all the time. I'm always looking for something to show and be like, cool. Um, snake gators, spotters, all that stuff. Um, I'm a healthy respect for them, but I'm not a slave of the class. Um, because nothing's actually out to get you, except mosquitoes. That's what I told kids. The only thing out to get you is mosquitoes. They're non discriminatory. They buy their best. So, I work with kids. I've come to the library several times, but I'm all the same. Um, and then, a lot of what I do is within Washington, not Irish, as it's closer, and it's easier for the kids to get there. But at this point, I visit three elementary schools once a month. Um, J.S. Clark, which is a science guided school, Bowley, and Barnhill Falk, all of which are low income minority schools. Um, those kids are great. Like, they ask me when the snake is coming, because I've been visiting them for years. They love doing all that stuff. The teachers, on the other hand, a couple of staff are like, well, you're not bringing that no legging thing, are you? I'm like, yes, I am. Um, and they all, like, pop away from me. Um, I also visit all four Head Start centers in Monroe every month and I meet with those kids. We do stuff, talk about nature. Because two to three to four year olds, never too early to start exposing them to nature. And those kids remember me, and I feel very fortunate in the sense that I've had kids who've moved up over years from Head Start to look at Santa. And they always ask me if I remember them, but they don't always do because there's a lot of them. I lie to all my kids. Um, they remember stuff, they remember the turtles, they remember the snakes, and to me that's like success because they're losing that fear. Um, we also try to get kids up fishing. I am a person, I teach kids to fish. So I'm do a program for me. Um, we also go hunting fishing camp where we teach kids about archery and ethical hunting. Um, and none of the stuff, all the stuff we do is free. We're not charging these kids for any of the field trips, any of that stuff. Um, last week I was super psyched. The fourth grade for me in Parish um, is coming out and scheduled a field trip for April to come out to the refuge. And I was super psyched about that to get those kids out to the refuge and walk around and look for snakes and spiders and all that stuff. Um, but that's my goal. Um, I've been lucky to be here some years. I've been back at HEP. I am not. This is like the longest place I've lived since I left home for college. <laughs> There's also rather less jobs in the National East um, But I really do love what I do here, and so I really appreciate it for having that opportunity here and reach out to the kids. I don't know if I'm going to be happy to enter a one day. And but on either route, or they tell me I have to like not talk about car service, my former agency, the But uh, they tell me I should on my new phone, and I said, sure, 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 all that service. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but thank you all for having me. Um, and if there are any questions, So, do you want to know how many kids come through uh, between the month of May? Well, this year I cut a lot of field trips in this month, in January. Um, over the course of the school year, we we have about 5,000 children who come through the refuge. And so I'm, as Mary mentioned, we are very low in staff. Um, so I depend on volunteers and interns. 
I pretty much talked all those children one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I am, I'm very much a hands-on field ranger. I have absolutely no desire to become management, really. It's all about bureaucracy and paperwork and you know, talking to people in the regional office. It's why I just get to be what I enjoy. And one of the jokes about being a ranger is you get paid in sunsets. Um, that's a <laughs> <laughs> I get paid better than sunsets, but you don't go into doing this if you want to make money. In all honesty, you don't my thing. So. Well, I just want to add, know that has been really wonderful to our parish. She comes to our summer programs that we do here. She comes to our after school programs we have here. Uh, and you know, she's been here many years. She's probably seen hundreds of our children here in our parish. So we thank you. Alright. Just one again, good afternoon. Uh, we thank uh, Sister Stephanie and the library personnel for always inviting us uh, to uh, try to enhance our African American history during this time of year. So I'm here to talk about uh, Mr. Leon Gray, playwright and director, who's a uh, native of Louisiana. He's a storyteller, historian, writer, director, and an actor. Uh, that director for him already put him on his resume. Uh, he told me he had a play that was coming out soon. And I just want to let him know that you know, we do have an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he probably played a, a rough story to life that uh, not often the female audition was a children's bedtime story. However, the significance of this work is that uh, he often confronts social norms and stereotypes uh, and helps bring people together and highlight the limitations of our outstanding black uh, history, lives that may be gone but not forgotten. So at the same time, his plays include Black Angels of Tuskegee, Kings of Harlem, Black Sparta, and his most recent play, Cowboy, which is debuted at the National Black History uh, Theater Festival in 2019 about the life of Bash Reed, which was a black cowboy. Uh, America's first U.S. Marshal and the true story of the Long Range. And it was some idea he was introduced about Bass himself. And here it is, none other than Mr. Leon Gray, playwright and slash director. <laughs> How's everyone doing? All right. uh, my theater voice. <laughs> So we had to uh, shift the monitor here so the image may be a little shifted. So just bear with us and look at it up on the screen. I want to thank St uh, Stephanie and all the Union Library uh, Committee for bringing put this all together and bring us here. This is a wonderful thing. As you know, I love black history. I just love everything there is about black history and bringing African Americans to life that we really don't know about. That's not history books. As the gentleman mentioned earlier, I want to play about the Tuskegee Airmen. And we know they're not official books, they should be. I want to play about uh, the first basketball team in Harlem, 1939, before the Globe Trials, the Harlem Reds. So I just love bringing our stories to life. And today, when she told me this was about the outdoors, I grew up in Alexandria, Louisiana. Uh -huh. Yeah, right down the street. <laughs> And I didn't do a lot of fishing, I did a lot of crawfishing. Oh, you know, okay. so everyone is talking about the outdoors. It just brought back memories of being a kid, drinking from the water hose to the end. Oh, so it just brought back some great memories. And I, I wanted to come here to speak about my new play that, that I wrote about, The Stealing with the Wild West. The question is, by a show of hands, and, and he hit a little bit earlier. How many of you guys remember the Lone Ranger, the radio show? Yeah? And they made a movie about it, et cetera, et cetera. So we were with that show. The Rapid the Radio announcer saying something like, On the plains of Arizona, the master of the skies waits patiently for his man to be caught. Sounds like an interesting episode, you would think, right? Well, that would be hundreds of stories told just like that. Now, before we get on, everyone do me a favor, okay? I want everyone to just close your eyes real quick. Just close your eyes. Remember the Long Ranger, right? This man who would ride on a white horse, who gave out silver dollars. 
Mm -hmm. who have an Indian companion. Can you say it? Now, I want you to open your eyes right now and see it as a black man. Bass Reeves. Yep, this is the man many believe who inspired the Lone Ranger character. He was a 19th century Arkansas slave who became a legendary deputy U.S. Marshal, capturing more than 3,000 criminals. Now, growing up here in Louisiana, we all have ridden horses, and uh, as a small boy growing up in Alexander, I would watch me the cowboy movies. The good and the bad and the ugly. Remember that from Clint Eastwood? True Grit with John Wayne. But I had never seen a black cowboy in any movie until I saw this crazy comedy called Blazing Saddles. <laughs> you know, and I sat down pondering, was part of what for my next show I wanted to write, you know? And I said, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to talk about African Americans who did something truly special in this country. And I was searching and searching and searching, and black cowboys of the Wild West kept coming up. And I was thinking, blacks in the West? I mean, I can't be real because I never heard of it. I never even heard of any about black cowboys. So I did some more research and found out that yes, there were black cowboys. During the Civil War, cattle owners they had trusted their slaves to tend their cattle herds while they were away. After the war, many of them were free slaves. So they were good. They were hired to help out of the cattle. And as I continued to read upon these men in history, there was one that no one never talked about. It always really stood out. He stood about a solid six feet, two tall inches, weighing about 200 pounds. He said he beat a man, two men, at the same time with bare hands. Folks would say if you got in a gunfight with them, it was like committing suicide. <laughs> I'll talk about the man who spoke with saw earlier. Bass Reeves. <coughs> a little history about Bass. He was born in 1838 Arkansas. He would become the first black U.S. Deputy Marshal west of the Mississippi River and one of the greatest frontier heroes in our nation's history. He was owned by a man named William Reeves of Texas. Bass took his surname of his owner, like the other slaves at that time. His first name came from his grandfather, Bass Washington. When the Civil War broke out, Texas sided with the Confederacy, and George Reeves went into battle taking Bass with him as his servant. Now, word goes that he and Bass got into this fight over a car game. And Bass beat him up and ran off into the Indian Territory. And that's when he learned everything. He took refuge with the, the Seminole Indians, the Cherokee, the Creek, learned their customs, learned their languages, their tracking skills, and most of all, learning how to shoot so well. Freed by the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 and no longer a fugitive, Bass left the Indian Territory and bought land in Arkansas. A year later, he would get married and have five boys and five girls, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he be, he be <laughs> Because he knew the Indian Territory so well, he would sometimes serve as a service scout for the U.S. Marshals, who were afraid to go into the Indian Territory alone, so they would take back. Now, because of his knowledge, and his arrogance as was well as his ability to speak several of their languages from staying with him so long, he was soon recruited to be a U.S. deputy. He was an opposing figure, did he? Always riding on a large white stallion, always passing out silver dollars to people. That's got so good at bringing in one of criminals that everyone was afraid when they found out he had a warrant out for him. Legend goes that. Legendary Alba Bell Star turned herself in when she found out that Bass had a warrant for her arrest because she didn't want any parts of it. The tales about he captured criminals are legendary. One of the story goes like this, and I want to read this to make sure I get it right. Bass set up camp 28 miles from where two criminals were, went through, where they were hiding in their mother's home. He disguised himself as a tramp, hiding his handcuffed pistols and badge under his clothes. Setting out on foot, he arrived at the house wearing an old pair of shoes, dirty clothes, carrying a cane, 
and wearing a flock of hat with three bullet holes in it. Now once he got to the home, he told the woman who answered the door that his feet were aching and a posse of marshals were after him. And they were the ones that shot three bullets in his hand. She invited him in and they began to tell him how her, her two young sons, they were outlaws and all the three of them, they should form a gang together. Now they continued to talk and after some settling, that's where a whistle comes from outside. And the woman went outside and responded with another whistle. And two men ride up. She introduced her sons to back. <coughs> after discussing various crimes, the three of them agreed that they would be a good idea to join up. So they bedded down for the day, sleeping in the same room. Bass watched the brothers carefully as they drifted off to sleep. He handcuffed them without waking them up. When early morning approached, he kicked that bass and they both jumped up and shot. He marched the brothers the full 28 miles to his camp with that mother screaming at him the whole way. Within days, the outlaws were delivered to the authorities. The mass collected a $5,000 reward. Mm -hmm. True story. Wow. Over the 35 years that Bass served as U.S. Deputy Marshal, he earned his place in history by being one of the most effective lawmen in the Indian Territory. 3,000 outlaws he brought in. 3,000. He helped detain the Wild West and never received one bullet. Now this was a fascinating story. I'm reading all this online. I'm like, I got to tell this into a play. So I said, okay, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about black cowboys and bass reads. So I was eager to begin writing my new show, my new play. And it took me three weeks to, three weeks to create my new play, Cowboy. Now my storyline would be set in 1888, 23 years after the abolition of slavery. U.S. Deputy Marshal Bass Reeves and his Indian companion, Grant Johnson, a Creek freedman, find themselves stuck in a saloon with two, a saloon with two wanted criminals. Sounds pretty cool, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was too bad. Jackson's in the building. And I want to make my characters vivid and clear. And these are all my actors in my theater company. So I wanted to make the, the characters very precise. Levi, he's deadly and conniving. He's a horse thief. His brother Gus is a heavy drinker. He's naive, horse thief. Silas was the bartender. He's fun, good energy. Grant was half Native American and half black. And of course, Bags. Now we will rehearse this play for four weeks. And it will have this debut at the National Black Theater Festival in 2019. Now when the show dates were released, all the performances sold out in under two hours. I mean, it's a fascinating time in festival history that all the shows will sell out. It's like everyone wanted to see the story about black cowboys. Everybody, but they had never seen it, they had never been done before. Bringing Bass Reeves to life for the first time on stage, where he is the uh, image from the show. Bring him off stage, people ask him, well, well, why is your name to play cowboy? It's just, it's not a sexy name, people are always say. And I said, well, see the play, we'll see. And once they saw it, they got their answer. There's a monologue in the play I wrote, where one of the characters, Gus, explains how the cowboy name came to be when he was a slave boy on the plantation. Can I share it with you? Yeah. So, you were acting a little bit? Yeah. All right. I'll read it. He says, cow. Master Lord's cows will always pull loose through the fence when the light and flash through the clouds. <laughs> don't know why they cry over. It's like they all have hands or fingers pulling on the wood to break loose and get free. Some detour into the fields of down back road, but they always seem to come back home. Except for them. Old blood chip. <laughs> <laughs> he was big, wide, must have stood about two feet inches high, weighing at least a full ton. As soon as the sky would light out black, old Buck Joe would hightail it through the air at full speed. The old sins would go out and bring him in. The old Buck Joe would have it. He was stoned and grunted his head, charging first at anyone who tried to throw a rope around his neck. And I swore I'd spend lots of money to bring up at least 50 minutes to pull him in. But one day, it was pouring down good. That's why I tied Billy Ray up against the tree, giving him a hard lash because he had learned how to be a simple word. 
in a restraining shower saying he was sorry and he would never ever try to read again. And as Master Will pulled that little back one more time, boom, lightning and thunder, just like that, old Buck Joe was off again. And that's where I screamed some bad words, Rich that went to take his hang out and get a ring, then shouts out, I can bring in old Buck Joe! So I'll go to that look. If you read the eyes, it says, well then, go get that cow, old one. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I spoke, can't believe you already that guy in that short time right up there. How'd you do that, Master Roy says? Two days later, boom, like it. Go get that cow, boy. Get ready, brings him in ten minutes. How'd you do that again? Then Ray got so good at bringing old Buck Joe, all the other slave owners. Nigga, I asked Master Roy if he could teach you through that slave how to wrangle their cows. Pretty soon, every plantation in South Carolina had two or three cow boys. <laughs> I was a small young at the time, a middle way rich man, I had a secret and didn't get that ghost back. He said, like slaves, they ain't want no rope around their cow. Don't think ghosts wasn't dead no more. You make devils come as soon as one to, to live free as much as they can. Lightning strikes was a sign for God to be set free, and off they went. They already knew the key was to touch the ghost, <clears throat> to fulfill the missing, to grab hold unto the possibility, to look in the eyes and connect his pain with theirs. Both understand that no matter how much you fight and struggle, the ghost wants to be satisfied and live free. And if it does that, no matter how much stress you take on the outside, the ghost will roll loose and make you hold all the way. The cowboys knew that. The cowboys knew the ghost was the key to no pain. That's how each and every one of us in here survived that way. That's how we all were alive right now. God knows that. The cowboy name will later be taken away and used by the men all around the world. Not going to extend from all those years ago. The story of black cowboys and bad reads deserves to be told. And I try to do my best to bring history and information and awareness in all the places I write. A few years ago, they put up statue of bad trees in his home state of at Arkansas. How about that? He died in 1910. At the present age of 71. To this day, no one knows where he's been. But events like this, the library continue to bring beautiful black history to life. We get the opportunity to tell people how we live. And we'll close your eyes one last time. One last time. To get our ghost back. The key to no pain. They're going to repeat after me for the Cowboys. For the Cowboys. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Can you tell us about your play now? Is it still running? Actually, um, we just did a run in Pittsburgh uh, about two months ago, and it reopens again in Miami in June. So continue to get Bass's story out, continue to uh, get the information about the black cowboys uh, to the world is very important to us. Yes? When you're doing a character, do you do a lot of research, or do you just make it up as you go? And Interesting enough, uh, in the past I've used a lot of my family members from Alexandria. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, so you see my uncle on stage, my 
cousin. Um, a lot of stories I create, I call it historical fiction. Like I'll take some historical facts and then create a story around it. Because it just gives me more freedom as a creator to, uh, to create something different. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. This is uh, I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying it. I like you all. So um, my part is easy here because I'm here to introduce someone uh, that I've known all my life. So, so when I read part of this, I can say, yep, yep, sure did. I remember when that happened, remember when this happened. Um, Mr. Vaughn Dixon, we call him Rail. They, they didn't put that on the table. <laughs> uh, he, he was born here in Union Parish in what we call Doggone. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Doggone is, that is. It's on Highway 33 South, and when you cross the bridge, it's about roughly three miles, and you can get past the dumpsters and take left or right, and all that's dog on And all that's dog on um, He's the third child of Mr. Pontiel and Mrs. Uh, Emma Dixon. He grew up in, and like I said, the village of Doggone, where he spent most of his time hunting and fishing and exploring outdoors. His father was an avid squirrel hunter, fisherman. Yep, sure was. His mother also enjoyed fishing. As a, as a family, they would spend a lot of time fishing various uh, fish ponds and bayous around Union Parish. His father would also take him uh, coon hunting along, you know, with his brothers and, and even other kids in the community that won't go uh, coon hunting at night. They knew the location of almost every persimmon tree in Union Parish and Union and Lincoln Parish. <laughs> Anybody know a thing about hunting those persimmons? That's, a, that's always a good spot to get to. They have that. They have that. <laughs> so uh, his love for the outdoors led him to attend. Uh, Grandma State University and who's out of tech? Uh, University, yes, Grandma, that name again. <laughs> Pops up everywhere. Uh, to pursue his career in biology and wildlife biology. A neighbor named Prentice Gibson, along with his brother Warren T. Gibson, had an impact on him from an outdoor standpoint and definitely from musical standpoint. They both had a background uh, similar to Pond. Uh, that nephew, Prefoss Gibson, exposed him uh, to gospel quartet music, uh, and eventually uh, his first serious music gig was with a group called the Sensational Golden Wonders. The Golden Wonders was a gospel group uh, back during, during that time in his life. In my life, they were a uh, very popular gospel group here in the area. But he learned the hardcore blues from Mr. Prentice and Mr. Warren T. Mm -hmm. They love guitar. Uh, he attended Fonda High School, as I said, and then Grandma, Louisiana Tech. He also attended the Federal Law Enforcement Academy. His career included stops with the Tennessee Valley Authority in Cardez, Cardez mm -hmm. Kentucky? Mm -hmm. Katie, okay. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Starkville, Mississippi, and presently works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Lacombe, uh, Louisiana, which is in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, he also uh, has a guitar building business, and repair, building and repair business. Plays guitars for various churches and groups, um, and was guitars uh, on, with, with another local person by the name of Kiko Pra. Oh, Kiko's from the area. And he played guitar on that song, on his hit song, That's My Baby. <laughs> so additionally, he has built guitars for musicians uh, that have appeared in uh, movies about the life of soul singer uh, James Brown. I, I remember that movie. That movie's called Get On Up. Uh -huh. and so I never knew that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so for two times, 
uh, Blues Guitar Player of the Year and International <laughs> Blues Champion, Mr. Sip, uh, Jamaya Richardson International Blues Competition, and Mr. Justin Gray of the award-winning Mississippi Bass Quad. We've all heard of him. He performs, he himself performs annually at the uh, New Orleans International Jazz and Heritage Festival in New Orleans. That's a big deal. And the New Orleans Essence Festival, that's a big deal. And the House of Blues, all that's big. So that's what's on the paper. Now let me add something else. <laughs> Pawn, Pawn, uh, what's not stated here is uh, his parents raised him and the rest of his siblings to go to church. And so he's a he's a God friend. He comes he comes from a God friend Christian family, and he's a God friend Christian man. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of like everyone else. Um, you know, this is the process that we can all believe. And it's all going to do. All the kings at one time, uh, or after having that, they used to do the same thing. One of the kings was my king. It's interesting, uh, once again, I, uh, I really thank God uh, for giving me an opportunity to uh, uh, come up in a small village of Dora on the land. And I'm not proud to be from Dora on the land. I don't know why I went to school here in this, in this town. Um, we, People from our own, we're always here with the dog. We're proud of the dog. We're really great athletes. Yeah, man. We're all sitting right here. Uh, Pastor Sam, uh, uh, Fred, and other athletes. So we're really proud of our little men in the dog. It is a, uh, almost like a small community right down the road here. And it's a community of people that uh, grew up on land, uh, fishing, hunting, uh, and uh, while I they were on the right room to become a, a federal game board, uh, I didn't always subscribe to the life of a federal game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, we do all the facility dream like Mike mentioned. Uh, any night we go out and uh, we do run the roads. Uh, uh, that was a guy named, uh, we used to call him this little green dude, a little bit of light. <laughs> and uh, what, what it is, he just stopped me from coaching uh, Wawa. We were out one night, uh, we were out one night, that's his older brother and myself and my older brother. Uh, Greenfield came by and said, you can be honest. And we loaded our rifles and everything and went out. We were going to go to the down the field. Then they, uh, let's do that. Let's do it. That was a big herd of years. We pulled up the car and put those lights in the field and hit the throat. We just all ran out. And all of a sudden, uh, oh, the green view of the awesome lights is in the house. Why do you keep the trees in this? We were all down the down here shooting, swimming, and finally just turned the lights out. We were full of water and wood and everything, and the end wasn't going to buy us. So yeah, I have a I have a wild night in the outdoors. That was just happening a long time ago. Long time ago, so three more things we call uh, a lot of us around here call it Polly. Uh, he had a uh, 50 something Thunderbird on the side of the steering wheel thing. You know. uh, we had to leave more some more gear out. I, I, mean, I said stop, but actually he didn't. <laughs> so, uh, he opened up a lot of great towels. He had a pack of towels and chased down some deer and he went up. And, uh, three boys, and shot one. And we tried to kill him. 
So uh, I grabbed it and threw it in the trunk of the car and we got home and we cleaned that thing. That deal was sailing in the back of the car. <laughs> I think three words added in the car. <laughs> so, so, so I, you know, we did a lot of stuff here. We did a lot of stuff We shouldn't have. Uh, uh, I was just talking about the greatest year in the time game. Oh, man, what was it? <laughs> Not this time. No. <laughs> that's that's the thing, y'all. You know, Sims didn't do a whole lot of that. Sims didn't do a whole lot of that. Sims didn't do a whole lot of that. We used to go and we used to stop up in the summertime. We'd take some uh, tater and stuff. And we'd just stop up these freaks and all of these and stuff. We'd take those tater and stuff. We'd want to get them out of them. Uh, go on the throw sacks for the fish. Yeah. <laughs>
I found myself back in the classroom where I stayed this time. <laughs> and I stayed away from girls on the board. <laughs> and managed to get a degree in wildlife biology and everything from Brampton and we also attended Louisiana Tech. And they started a program called the Brampton Cooperative Wildlife Project. Myself, Maury, and a few other people. And one of them actually like, hey, hey, I'm gonna be doing an organization with us. We like the assistant director of this outfit, a guy named Ron Ford. So we started this uh, program, we would go all across uh, South Louisiana and other places. And when we go there, we noticed that we were the only African Americans there in the crowd. And we had a very firm and stiff instructor named Dr. Tobin. He really drove it home to us to be better than Marvin said. You have to be, you have to be three times better than your uh, none like counterparts. Uh, and it's still that way. Like somebody just said in the it's still that way. So we, we did good, and uh, all of us that went through that program are now working in some that's uh, of the environment, but it's all that all of the assistant director out there of property and the representative of the So, with the site that we have a long way to go in this outfit, uh, Maury alluded to it earlier, there's only the people that do what Maury and I would do this organization, there's only 14 of us in the whole United States that do the job that we do. And of that 14, most of them are from here in Louisiana. Uh, and a, a lot of them went to school at Grandland State University. So it's a very, very, very small percentage of us out here. We run across a lot of obstacles uh, along the way. And I always look at it as, uh, as opportunities to learn. I mean, I've seen things that have been said to me that would just totally blow your leg. But I didn't get mad, and I guess sometimes, I, I guess when we're in a room, we like drones. Uh, yeah. I recall one really comical incident where I had a job with the agriculture department, and I, my job was to go out and inventory how many uh, fish are being eaten by these people around here about fish training for their very good characters and eat dress. My job was to go and uh, determine how many of these birds to eat fish. And I would randomly call, I live over in Mississippi in the Delta, I would randomly call people and say, I'll be over there to your place on whatever day I was in the store. So I went to a guy's house named Mr. Coleman. I don't want to forget his name. I go up to Mr. Coleman's house and I went and knocked on the door. And I found the little white lady came to the door and said, Mr. Coleman, I hired anybody in Chicago. I was like, wow. <laughs> So I got back on the door, and I tell the story about what happened. And I got back on the door, and this time Mr. Coleman is out. He comes to me. He said, Oh, did you tell him I'm not here to do a job? I'm not here to do a job. I'm talking to you on the phone. Or are you here to do an inventory? You know what I'm saying? He said, You're not coming around here, are you? I said, No. I said, Why are you asking? Don't look like you act like a dog when you come around here. So he reaches me. I think it's so hard to have a good job. So I just wanted to really see if I'm real. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and told the guy, oh, my guy, was I had no I said, you can't just pitch me. <laughs> <laughs> see if I'm real. So this is kind of stuff, this is kind of stuff that we, uh, we have encountered and we still encounter. Uh, on the job on a day to day basis. So, and again, this it is kind of weird, but uh, the lesson that those things have taught me are the, are the things that our parents told us as when we were kids coming up, how they had to go through certain struggles to make it to way ahead and made it in life. So, and, and, and to live that and to experience that was something really, really uh, bizarre to me because. Even though know, growing up around here in Laura Home in Louisiana, I really, I guess I knew where to go and where not to go. Uh, so I really had not experienced that kind of uh, behavior until I moved this once they over. Uh, but once they found out what I was doing, 
and the reason I was doing it, uh, those very people that were looking at me all crazy, uh, some of those people cried when I moved back to Louisiana. They were pointing me. Now my dog was 58 in those days. was a shoot. I was a shoot. I learned that from <laughs>
call them, you know, a bunch of them. That, that put an end to our peace dealing career. That didn't last very long. So I, I wasn't very successful in doing all the crazy things that would get you in trouble. So I guess I had no choice to then do something, which I should be successful. I didn't, I didn't make a very good criminal. He <laughs> bad. Uh, but I love you, Miss Dear, I uh, Mr. George Allen's food package. But anyway, once again, it's, it's, it's been great. And it's such an honor to get here and be able to come home and speak before the, the hometown crowd and to share the podium with such uh, wonderful people. I mean, yes, amen. Yeah. I was doing some dangerous things. And as and, and Maury always pointed point out earlier, it's great to walk into a place and see uh, a crowd. We don't, trust me, what we do, we don't see a whole lot of us out here. Oh, not, in a, not in a setting like this here. I, I just happen to uh, work now in a place called Lacombe, Louisiana. Uh, um, but we see a whole lot of like, people down there fishing and crabbing and stuff. But, but they're always amazed when they see me drive. Uh, it's like, wow, I've never seen a, a brother in one of those kind of trucks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's fascinating um, to live in the community. And, and sometimes, uh, early on in the career, like Jerome Ford, uh, one of the guys who went to school, uh, he, he was actually pulled over a few times by the police because he was driving one of these trucks with the, the big logos and stuff on there. And he was like, detained him for a while. And, and, and they called over the record dog said, oh, yeah, he works here. And he wow, he wants these kind of trucks. And 2020 is still weird. And, and because I'm such a rarity, more and everyone is such a rarity, uh, uh, everyone knows me now in that part of uh, Louisiana. I don't have to introduce myself to anyone. Uh, they, they all know who I am because it's so rare and so bizarre to see one of us doing what we're doing. Uh, so everybody gets to know me. So we, uh, it's just kind of weird to walk with you and tell you the names. Who do I know this guy? One of that's how rare we are in this, in this world of wildlife policy and conservation. And so I know she she gets it. I, you know, I know it's interesting to be out there to be like female fishing. Because most of the time we associate that with Yeah, we see a lot of you fishing. <laughs> you know, on a five-gallon bucket. <laughs> That's what we are familiar with. About. That's why I asked the question to be able to go back and, and to your roots and fish with the game bowl and stuff. Anyway, I, I don't want to make y'all glad twice on uh, Lee Ernest Johnson. I, 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 I pulled a lot of people from home. I, I haven't forgotten you all. I, I do a lot of folks. Lee Ernest Johnson says, uh, I don't want to make you glad twice. Glad to see me get up here and glad to see me sit down. <laughs> So if y'all have any questions, you know, please leave that. Yeah, I tell young people all the time I talk to, and they don't have jobs, and they're looking for a job, I tell them all the time, it's not all about the pay. No. What, I call, what I call is a package deal. Is there a package deal that you do? What I mean by that, are there benefits for general health care? Yes. Does that go along with what they do? Yes, the greatest part of this job and one of the reasons why I'm still doing it uh, is that it has excellent health care benefits. Yes, yes. benefits are great. The, uh, the pension is not so bad, and, and, and the pay isn't bad. Uh, and as Maura pointed out earlier, when, you, when we took these jobs, when Maura and I took these jobs 30-some uh, years ago, I mean, into my 32nd year, when we took these jobs 30-some years ago, I was making uh, Fourteen thousand one hundred and fifty-eight dollars. Do you remember the number? Fourteen thousand one hundred and fifty-eight dollars. I won't give a specific number as to what I make now, but it's, it's in the six figures. So, as he pointed out, don't don't take the job because of the money. Take the job because of the passion of wanting to do this. This is something I want to do, and somebody wants to say, build it and they will come. So, 
in this case, if you want it bad enough and you strive to be the best that you can be, strive to be the best biologist you can be, the best fisherman, the best well, playwright, the best cyclist, the best educator that you can be, and then the money will come. The people will be in behind you. So, for example, I haven't heard people just come up to her and say, can we sponsor you? That's a great thing. When you know you have reached that level in your chosen profession, if someone wants you to wear their name, your, their name on their shirt to endorse you, that's that's a big thing. So I didn't go into this worrying about the money. Uh, I just wanted the job, just wanted the opportunity to show what I can do. Uh, I'm gonna eat. Uh, and, um, <laughs> I had a, I had a, I had a um, grab and gravy sandwich uh, last week. I, so I'm gonna eat. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm taking my, I, got, I, I had a rabbit. I'm, I'm serious. I had a wild rabbit sandwich. Yeah, some other times, that thing was absolutely. I ate that as a kid. Uh, we used to get a dollar a piece, and I'll, I'll mention all these crimes. Miss uh, <laughs> Birdie Warren used to give us a dollar a piece for our mama do. Miss Birdie, a dollar a piece for our mama do. We go kill our mama do get Miss Birdie and uh, possums. We get like seven by seven piece for possums. These are all things you can't do. Now, if you did that now, more and I would track you down. <laughs> You know, the what? statute of limitations has run out <laughs> So I can talk about all this stuff that I posted and killed uh, back, back in the day, you know. But uh, the statute of limitations are run out, so... But the rabbit sandwich that I had last week was actually legal, so... But I'm gonna, I'm gonna survive. I'm gonna survive, and so that's why I wasn't worried about the money. Uh, as long as Mr. George Allen was uh, if still playing keys and had a school bus, <laughs> then I had a place to uh, eat. On all my dad around and you know all the cemeteries around, I'm, I'm going to eat. And somebody talked about uh, George Washington Carver uh, making all kinds of things uh, out of it. But well, sweet potatoes, we <laughs> use those with the <laughs> So, So, but anyway, uh, we don't eat. <laughs> so if y'all have questions, please, please ask this great panel uh, all kinds of questions and stuff. Right? <laughs> This is a question to you. Oh. You were supposed to send me some pictures of guitar. Why well, I got some out there? <laughs> you look at them. I, 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 have a, I have a correction for you. Um, I had to look it up. Uh, I've been a while. It started off at a GS4 um, on the GS11. Now it's about 31,000. That's usually a good for like college students or something. And that's good benefits. Yeah, that's good benefits if you get going through the time. And then. Yeah. 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 And then. Even at that, that's good. You still would be moved here and there yeah. if you want to. And that's been one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of people don't know the move to college. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's mandatory. If you're going to do it on the federal side, so the state side, and then you're on the Fed side, the federal side. So, so on the Fed side, um, you may have to, but it's not required. That's right. But it's just like anything else. You want to reflect the growth. Yeah. So in order to do it, you're going to have to move to the top. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, thank you. You're a good guy. You're a good guy. Back in 1972, one of the two things that I wanted to be was state trooper or gambler. And when I went to the, the the place where they were interviewing people for, because they were interested in getting black people in, that in Arkansas, one of the gang members asked me, you know, was I a criminal? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, got, you have to be a good criminal. <laughs> <laughs> so you just confirmed. Yeah, I think I'm a criminal. You have to. Uh, let me, let me say one other interesting thing, um, because the world has changed so drastically when, from the time when, when I went to school right here to nowadays. So, uh, and I can say this, I, no one's going to get in trouble because uh, So, 
what I liked about uh, Fred's father, is he drove the school bus, and I could bring my deer rifle and put it on the bus. <laughs> and, and at the end of and, and, and the day, my self, tenant men, Bulls, Air Royce, oh, you know. uh, Luke Chef, and all these people, we would get off and we would go deer hunting. Uh, Mr. George Allen, Marcus Soft Allen, we walked and we would, we would walk, and everyone lived along that pipeline that ran from 33. Uh, back up from, uh, the pipeline comes right out of my back door. So, as, as we walked the pipeline, one friend get off, another friend get off, and I was the last person to get, get home. So, we actually killed a lot of deer, rabbits, and stuff as we as we went. So, we, yeah, we took our rifles and stuff. So, that was great back in the day. Don't tell all well, before Miss Mel Wade and Miss Jackie Hill come up to introduce our exhibit on the other side, I just wanted to mention two quick things. One, uh, Mr. Charles Paxton back in this corner, uh, and Miss Kimmy Paxton in back in this corner. They're actually filming this forum, and once. <laughs> <laughs> and once they do some significant editing <laughs> this section, uh, we will be using this film uh, pro provided on checkout from the library. But student groups can use it, uh, schools and churches can check it out uh, so that maybe we can continue to educate our students. Uh, on, on the information that they provided. Uh, I do want to introduce Ms. Marilyn Hollis. She just came in. Uh, she's on our library board of uh, the trustees here at the library. She has put together a wonderful uh, reception on the other side. So after um, Ms. Hill and Ms. Wayne introduce our exhibit, we'd like to invite you on the other side to tour. And we'd like for you all to stay, come on the other side, and maybe stand by your exhibit. Um, <laughs> that way people can come and ask you questions and I'll talk to you a little bit more, but thank y'all very much. Miss Nail, Miss Jackie. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. The path is not easy. The climbing is rugged and hard, but the glory at the end is worthwhile. Quoted by Matthew Henson, the first man to trek to the North Pole. And we want to introduce you to our library exhibits, which are on the other side in the main library. Because as soon as we leave here, I know that the panelists will be set up on the other side also. But we have some other exhibits that we want you to be sure that you take a look at because a lot of hard work has gone into this display. Good evening, everyone. I'm a little hoarse, so I won't be doing too much talking. But I am Nell Wayne, the Mayor's Administrative Assistant here at Fargo. Library exhibit Big Nets. William Allen, urban farmer. Benjamin Banneker, surveyor naturalist. Maury Beckford, wildlife refuge manager. James Bedworth, fur, trade, fur trader, mountain man. Dion Bluford, space explorer, astronaut. George Washington Carver, former agriculture. Nova Clark, environmental educator. Bessie Coleman, aviator, adventurer. Holt Collier, Hunter, Soldier, Ranger. O'Neill Ray Collins, Botanist. Sophia Donenberg, Mountaineer. Mr. Pine Dixon, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Esteban, Early Explorer. Stagecoach Mary Fields, Wild West Mail Carrier. John Francis, Environmentalist, Walker. Juan Garrido, African African American conquistador. Leon Gray, playwright, Broadway director. George Gibbs, polar explorer. Rahawa Hell, camper, hiker. Robert Harris, wilderness trekker. Matthew Nixon, North Pole explorer. Langston Hughes, poet writer. Shelton Johnson, park ranger. Kai Leitner, climber. Nat Love, cowboy. Wangari Mathal, environmentalist zoology. Carl Malone, outdoor sportsman. James Moss, bicycle corps. Bass Reeves, U.S. Marshal, cowboy. John Baptiste Point de Seville, settler founder. Torrance Strong, cyclist, activist. 
Robert Taylor Distance Hiker. <coughs> Rico Witty Professional Angler. York Explorer. York Explorer Guide. Charles Young, Buffalo Soldier, National Park Superintendent. <coughs> One of the great losses to African culture from slavery was the loss of kinship with the earth. John Shelton, Yosemite National Park Ranger. You're welcome to join us on one of those.